Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the show. I am David, and this is uh, A Thousand Shimmering Lights. Let me just hit the play button on this real fast. There we go. Okay, so, um, first of all, as you can see by the fact that I am dressed like a generic wizard who is in no way associated with any copyrighted material belonging to Amazon or the Tolkien Estate, uh, this is the Halloween special episode. <laughs> Um, you see the got the campfire going, there it is, instead of uh, my usual uh, planetarium, although I do have that. Uh, oh, hold on a second, I had it. There we go. I do have that pulled up as well, and uh, my visuals and stuff as, as well. Um, but tonight's episode is going to be a special sort of episode, um, and oh, my, my fire just stopped. Okay, there it goes. Um, tonight's going to be a special episode. Tonight is the Sky Stories episode, and we are going to um, dispense entirely with my usual uh, scientific show where we talk about uh, our science of astronomy. And tonight is just going to be all about myths, folklore, legends, and various stories about the sky. So I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, let me check real fast to see what the viewership is looking like. Let's see here. Uh, I got a couple people. Okay, cool, cool. And I know a lot of people watch these uh, later on recording. So I'm just going to go ahead and launch straight into a story, I guess. So there once was a spider named Anansi. And Anansi was bored. And the reason he was bored is because he didn't have any stories to tell. Uh, nobody had any stories to tell, in fact. Uh, the sky god Niame had all the stories. So Anansi went to Niame and asked if he could buy the stories. But Niame assured him that nobody had ever been able to afford his stories. The price was too high. But Anansi insisted and said, I will pay whatever the price. And Niame said, okay. I need you to bring me four creatures, four dangerous creatures. I need you to bring me Osini the Python, uh, the Moboro Hornets, Osebo the Leopard, and the Moatia Fairy. And Anansi said, not only will I bring you these, I'll also bring you my mother. So Anansi went into the world and said about his task, and he went and he told his wife about uh, the deal he'd made. And so his wife assisted him with these tasks. Uh, first, they went and they got a long branch from a tree. And they went to where they knew Osini the python lived. And they made a pretend show of arguing. You know, the, also the wife was like, no, he's, he's, you know, you're out of your mind. He's, I told you, I saw him. He is longer than you think he is. He's longer than that branch. And uh, Anansi said, no way. I mean, he's, he's big, but that's a huge branch. Like, I, I think you're exaggerating. And they went back and forth like this and had a, a bickering about, you know, some nonsense like couples do, arguing over whether or not Osini was longer than this particular branch or not. And Osini overheard, overheard the conversation, and he comes out and he says, you know, I heard you guys talking, you know, what are you guys talking about? You know, and Anansi says, well, you know, my wife says that you're longer than that branch. And I can see that you're, you know, a really long python. I don't mean to disrespect, but I don't know. That branch is huge and I'm just not buying it. And Osini is like, oh, heck no. We're solving this right now. So he slithers on up next to the branch. But then, you know, uh, Anansi starts saying, well, you know, I, I see like when you move your head up there, your, your tail kind of slithers up and, and it's kind of hard to tell. You're kind of wriggling everywhere. You know, try to be as straight as you can and... and you know, Sini's trying to be as straight as he can and right up against the stick. Uh, and then Anansi and his wife lashed him to the branch. And they just tied him right up. So they take uh, the python to uh, to Nyame, uh, the, the sky god. Then they have to go back and get the Maboro hornets. So uh, also, again, has an idea and she tells Anansi what he should do. And he gets a big gourd and he fills uh, about halfway with water. And he goes to where the hornets are and he starts looking around for them and he sees they're all kind of clustered on this one bush. So he gets a big banana leaf and then he throws a bunch of water at the hornets and then douses himself in the leaf. And the hornets come out and at first they're angry and Anansi's like, oh my goodness, did you see that rain? And he's got the leaf over his head 
And he's like, yeah, it looks like it's going to get worse, man. And, and you know, you should, you should run for shelter here. I got this gourd. You can take shelter in the gourd. So the hornets are like, oh, sweet. And they go into the gourd and caps off the gourd, right? <laughs> so he captures the entire swarm of hornets, takes it to Niame. Uh, then he remembers he has to get the, uh, the leopard, Osebo. Is Osebo? I think that's his name. Uh, and so he goes and he just digs a big pit and covers it with branches. And then Osebo falls in and Anansi goes and gets him. Uh, knocks him out, throws something at his head, knocks him out. There's a couple different versions and ties him up and takes him to uh, Nyami, the sky god. Uh, then he has to get the fairy. So what he does is he makes a doll, like a, uh, there's like a certain, I actually have a visual for this. Hold on a second. Uh, is it going to show? One of these, right? He, he, uh, oh, hold on. The campfire is in front of my visuals. There we go. He makes one of these dolls. You might have seen these before. Uh, and what he does is he takes the sap from a gum tree and covers it completely to make it all sticky. Uh, and then he uses his webs and basically strings it up like a puppet. And then he gets like a bowl of uh, delicious yam paste. He puts a bunch of yam paste in the bowl and puts this uh, doll in front of the yam paste. And he puts it where he knows a bunch of fairies are. So one of the Moatia fairies comes up and sees the doll and sees the yam paste and asks the doll, hey, can I have some of the yam paste? And uh, Anansi sort of puppets it and he's like, yes, right? He gets it to nod its head. Uh, and so uh, the fairy eats all the yam paste and then says, okay, thank you. And then Anansi just ignores the fairy, right? Uh, the fairy feels insulted, so uh, she tries to slap the, the doll and her hands get stuck. And she tries to slap it again, her other hand gets stuck. And then she tries to kick it, and her foot gets stuck. And next thing you know, she's completely stuck to this doll. And so Anansi takes the doll, uh, goes and gets his, his mother, and takes them all to uh, Nyame, the sky god, and says, See, I brought you all four things, and also my mother. Right? Uh, and so the sky god is impressed, and he says, You know what? Okay. And he gives Anansi his stories. And then Anansi shares all those stories with us. And that's why... In um, Akan cultures, like the Ashanti culture, these are called spider stories, right? Stories are called spider stories. And the reason I wanted to open with that story tonight is because the sky god is the source of the stories, right? In this story of Anansi. And so tonight, all of our stories are going to pertain to the sky. And it's appropriate that these stories come from the sky god. So I hope you guys will have fun tonight and enjoy our presentation. As we tell some spider stories together tonight and learn all the different stories and folklore and lore and things about the night sky. Uh, let me go back to the sky, right? This is where we are going to be hanging out tonight, telling our sky stories. Uh, looks like we have a couple people here. Cool, cool. Welcome, welcome. Uh, with that story out of the way, I, I kind of wanted to do that like an intro, but let me do a little bit of house cleaning. So this show, if you're new to the channel, this is... A Thousand Shimmering Lights. This is the planetarium show where you are the planetarium director, by which I mean that your questions and comments in the chat drive the discussion. That's usually what I say at the beginning of these shows, although lately I've been doing themes. But even within the theme, you guys are absolutely welcome to throw ideas and things in the chat, drive the discussion. I don't script these in advance, although tonight I do have a whole bunch of stories I kind of collected in advance. Um to get ready for tonight to make sure I had enough stories. Um, but uh, I definitely like for this to be a conversation. So be talkative in the chat. We'll chit chat back and forth. Um, if you have a story about the sun, the moon, the stars, the constellations, whatever that you're interested in, put that in the chat, man. We'll talk about it. I'm always up to learn new stories. Um, but let me go ahead and do the house housekeeping. Like I mentioned. So um, I am not this, uh, not you right now. There we go. I am actually the membership director of the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. Uh, for now, I've actually, um, they've asked for officers who are going to run again, and I've decided not to run again as membership director. I'm going to let somebody else do that now, but for now, I am the membership director of the club. Even after I'm no longer membership director, I'll continue plugging them on this channel, obviously. Um, if you live in the Jacksonville area, we are the Astronomy Club. We are the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society, and our website is, is right there, uh, nephis.org. 
move that. There we go. Uh, and you can check out our website. You can check out about our memberships um, to join the club if you want to be a part of what we do. Uh, I'm the worst salesman ever for the club because I'm always the first to point out that everything we do is free. Every outreach program we do, this YouTube channel, uh, which isn't actually owned by the club. This is just my channel. Um, we always do all of our stuff for free for people because we want to educate and spread information about astronomy and all that good stuff. Um, but if you want to be a member of the club, uh, we have memberships. The rates are right here. Um, the only difference between benefactor and these other levels is if you just want to get more money. So uh, you don't get anything special for being a benefactor. Your name is mentioned in our newsletter, and we're very grateful. But otherwise, there's no difference between it and the individual level. Um, but we do have benefactors in the club who just like what we do and they just want to give more. So you can, of course, fill this out and be a member. Uh, I am going to quickly talk about some of the upcoming events for the club. And then I'm going to cut to the chase because I do want to tell a lot of stories tonight. And I want to take some time telling the stories. So uh, first thing I'm going to mention is that tomorrow night we have our uh, stargaze at Fort Clinch. Uh, Fort Clinch is this this event. It says 530 on our calendar. That's actually when they're going to let us in to set up. The event starts at 7. Um, they closed registration for this last Friday at 373 people. So if you are a member of Nephis and you are watching this uh, live, I would say, because by tomorrow it's too late. But if you're watching this live and you're a member of Nephis and you own a telescope, please consider showing up to this event with your telescope because we want to make sure we have enough because people are going to be lined up at the telescopes uh, with a crowd that huge. So that should be a blast. We're going to be in the fort. Uh, it's going to be nice and dark. And also tonight and tomorrow night are the peak of the Orion and Meteor Shower. So that's cool. Uh, something we're going to be able to see from Fort Clinch. But we'll also look at the planets. Um, and we'll look at some deep sky objects as well. Because we won't have a moon. So it should be well and truly dark for us to see some really good sights. With that in mind, this Saturday is another dark sky observing session. I won't be able to make this one. I actually have conflicting plans with my friends currently. Um, but these are always nice. I'll try and arrange for somebody to meet people at the firehouse uh, for those who plan to attend. And then next weekend, uh, for Nevis members only, and you know we've already kind of done the registration, we're going to have a trial run star party. Um, this is to try out this campground and see if we're going to have bigger star parties there in the future. Um, but for now, this is kind of a small one. It's a trial run uh, with us in the park, uh, and that's going to be uh, next weekend, and I'll be there, and that should be pretty exciting. Uh, and then real fast in November, we've got our Hannah Park uh, session on the first Saturday, and we are double booked again. I try to make all of our Hannah Park sessions, but Pine Ridge is one of those that I've kind of built up a rapport, so I can't be in two places at once. I won't be at Hannah Park uh, the, the 5th. Of November, I'm going to be at the Pine Ridge Stargaze, which is a uh, a public outreach event for a local um, housing subdivision called Pine Ridge, uh, where we'll be doing our usual setting up telescopes, later laser pointer, sky tour, the whole bit. Uh, then um, we're going to have our board of directors meeting on the seventh, uh, and then on the twelfth of November is going to be uh, our general meeting is going to be held in the Mosh. And this is actually, instead of our usual general meeting, this one's going to be completely, our meetings are, our general meetings are always open to the public, but this one's really going to be public oriented because this is how to buy a telescope, right? So if, you, if you're considering buying a telescope, you live in Jacksonville, you're going to want to come to this because we're going to talk about everything you should be looking for, what to buy, what not to buy, how to figure out the right telescope for you, right? The differences between different types. Right, What's, uh, what do all these specs mean when we talk about aperture and focal length and all that? That's what that is going to be. And then, let's see here, one, two, three. And then the 17th is going to be my next live stream. So um, that's where I'm going to stop for now because I can talk about the rest of that stuff after that live stream. Uh, somebody says, oh, hey, Teresa, what's up? Uh, and then somebody says, um, someone will definitely be at Hannah Park on the 5th. Oh, yes, I should clarify. I'm not going to be at Hannah Park on the 5th, but there will definitely be people at Hannah Park on the 5th. Um, we're just kind of splitting our resources. Um, let's see here. Cooper says, all hands on deck. He's going to come for sure. Yeah, I sent an email to our club. That's what he's referring to where I said all hands on deck for that um, for that Fort Clinch. It may be our biggest. I don't think we've ever had 300 people at an event before. Um, not 
that I can remember. It that's a lot of people. That's that's going to be a huge event. Um, excellent, excellent. And Teresa, definitely glad to have you tonight as well. All right. So with that housekeeping done, let's get back to the point of tonight, which is, uh, which is uh, telling stories, right? So I'm going to go ahead and move over to Stellarium now and start telling one of my favorite Sky stories. And that is the myth of Perseus. So again, tonight is not going to be the usual scientific uh, descriptions of, uh, you know, celestial bodies. Tonight is us around the campfire, right? Let me bring back our campfire here. Make sure it's still going. It keeps freezing up on me. Uh, I don't own this campfire animation, by the way. This is somebody's YouTube video, and I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> if the creator finds me, I will link it in the description. I, you know, I, I, I thank you. But anyway, um, we're going to have our uh, campfire discussion here tonight about uh, these stories. So I'm just going to tell them in like a once upon a time kind of way, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. But definitely don't feel like you have to be silent and listen. You can definitely talk in the chat and chit chat, whatever. I'll, I'll check on it once in a while. Um, and we'll have a good time. And again, if you have a cool star story, a, a cool bit of, oh, the term is star lore, by the way. That's the term that's sometimes used to refer to myths, folklore, legends about the stars. Um, definitely put that in the chat. Uh, oh, and another thing, sorry, one more bit of housekeeping. Before I begin, I want to say that I am going to try and tell all these stories. These stories are from various cultures around the world. Um, I love these stories. I think they're awesome. I think they're wonderful. And I just want it to be known that some of these stories are going to be from cultures that are not mine, right? That are, that I'm not a member of. And, uh, I will of course try to tell this, all the stories as respectfully as I can. Um, some of these stories are even from living religious traditions, uh, or people's spiritual practice. Um, and so by bringing them up tonight, I'm not trying to make any kind of value judgment about them or anything. I just think the stories are wonderful and that we should all celebrate them. Uh, so I just wanted to be known. That's kind of where my mindset is at, is I want to be respectful to all the cultures that these stories are from. And, uh, if your culture has some story I don't know about that, I, that you think is really cool, tell me, I'd, I'd love to hear it. And if I get any of these stories wrong, uh, and you know, I get them wrong by all means, correct me in the chat as well. Um, because I don't want to accidentally spread the wrong version of something, but do be in mind, do, do keep in mind that many stories do have multiple versions, right? A lot of these old folk tales and, and myths and legends and things have different versions and different tellings. And so even though you might've heard a different version of the story than I tell, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm telling it wrong. All right. So with all the hedging my bets out of the way, uh, let's talk about Perseus. This one I know pretty well because I'm a, I've always loved Greek mythology since I was a kid. So, uh, once upon a time, <laughs> a long time ago, there was a king named Acrisius and Acrisius, uh, did not have any sons. He was, uh, he wasn't childless. He had a daughter, but he never produced a male heir and tried for years and just had the one daughter, Danae. And he was worried about the fact that he didn't have an heir and it bothered him. So he went to um, the Oracle at Delphi and he asked the Oracle, he said, will I have a son? The Oracle says, no, you will have a grandson though. Your daughter will have a son, but he will grow up and he will slay you. Right? So Acrisius was obviously not happy to hear that his grandson was going to kill him one day. So he decided he was going to try and prevent this. Now in, ancient Greek society, kin slaying was a huge no-no, right? If you, if you slew a, kin, a kinsman, the Aranes, the Furies would come and torment you, right? So Acrisius can't just kill his daughter Danae. Um, and I don't think he wants to, but what he decides he's going to do is, well, if she never um, is with a man, then there's not going to be a grandson, right? So he has this big brass, like, cistern style prison made for her and locks her up in there and makes sure that, you know, food and things are lowered to her only ever by women, of course. Uh, and that she is, she is to have no contact with men whatsoever. Um, 
Now, of course, while this is going on, Zeus looks down and says, ooh, who's that beautiful woman in the cistern? Uh, and if you've seen Jurassic Park, you know life finds a way and Zeus finds a way. So Zeus transforms himself into a, a shower of gold and pours himself like gold, like fine gold dust through the bars of the prison. And uh, because this is a show that people watch with their kids, I'll just say that Zeus comes and spends some time with Danae and then leaves. Uh, and then, of course, Danae is with child and she bears a son and she names him Perseus. Now, Acrisius uh, is a little bit perturbed and more than a little bit confused to discover that his daughter has um, given birth. But he is uh, still determined to try and prevent this prophecy any way he can. So what he does, again, he's like, I can't just kill her. That's kinslaying. So he decides to do something that is honestly, in my opinion, a little bit silly. He, he gets a big wooden box and he um, has Danae and Perseus thrown in the box, nails it shut, and then just chucks it in the ocean and just says, hey, you know, if the ocean kills her, it wasn't me. Uh, you know, I just sent her on a cruise. It's not my fault. It's just a wooden box. Um, no, it's totally your fault, Acrisius. But uh, Acrisius's desire to accidentally kill his daughter is thwarted because um, when Zeus is your dad, Poseidon's your uncle, right? So as this box is drifting out at sea, Poseidon makes sure that the sea is nice and calm, right? There's waves all around, but not for the box. The box is just drifting. It's nice and smooth ride all the way until it gets to an island whose name I forget and don't feel like looking up right now. But the, the box washes ashore on this island, right? And uh, this fisherman discovers it, pries it open because uh, he hears a baby crying inside and discovers Danae and Perseus. And this fisherman has a name. His name is Dictus. Now, uh, which I think just means fishing net. Uh, so Dictus has you know, discovered this woman and her child and he ends up marrying Danae and raising uh, Perseus as his own son and Perseus grows up to adulthood. Now, Dictus has a brother and Dictus's brother is named Polydectes, which means he who receives many guests, which is kind of a cool name, actually. Um, no, sorry, it's it, many gifts. Sorry, I'm, I'm confusing it with uh, one of the epithets for Hades. Polydectes is, uh, it's either all giving or he get, he receives many gifts. It could be interpreted either way. But Polydectes is the king of this island, uh, which is a little weird because his brother is just a lowly fisherman, but that's how it is. And, of course, he gets a look at his sister-in-law and is like, oh, she is cute, All right? Uh, and so he wants to marry her, but he realizes that, uh, first of all, his brother's going to be a problem, but his brother's a pushover, I mean, whatever. The real problem is Perseus, right? Because Polydectes realizes that Perseus has grown up to be a strapping young lad, right? He is he is no pushover. And so Polydectes is like, I've got to come up with a plan to get rid of Perseus. So he gathers all the local nobles uh, to his home, and he tells them all, he says, hey, I am going to marry Hippodamia, um, and I need everybody to give me a horse, <laughs> right? I'm going to present all these horses as the... Um, wedding gift as the dowry for Hippodamia. Whose name, I'm not sure exactly what it means, but the hippo part means horse, so that's kind of appropriate. So all the nobles are giving him gifts, but Perseus is the adopted son of a poor fisherman. He doesn't have a horse. So he doesn't have anything that he can give Polydectes. So he says, I, I don't have a gift for you, um, but, you know, name anything and I will go get it for you. Which, if it feels like if that was Perseus's mindset, Go get a horse. But at any rate, Perseus says, name whatever it is, and I will, get, I will go get it for you. And so Polydectes says, I want you to bring me the head of Medusa. All right. So Medusa is one of the Gorgon sisters. And let me see if I can bring up a visual for this. Um, I recently found out that apparently on Wikimedia Commons, it's not enough that it's on Wikimedia Commons. There's different rules for different pictures when it comes to attributions. So let me see if I can find one that requires no restrictions. For Medusa, or you know, let's do uh, Gorgon. That'll that'll get me the right thing. Yeah, now we're talking. Okay, so if you're used to seeing Medusa as like a beautiful woman, um, that's not the ancient Greek image of Medusa. Um, so 
the Gorgons, there were three of them. Um, I'm blanking on the third one's name. There's Uriale, Medusa, and I will remember the third one later when it no longer matters. Or if somebody, actually, if somebody remembers her name, uh, definitely throw it into, uh, into the chat. Um, one of our, one of our, uh, viewers says, if you're enjoying, hit the like button. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, not Crete. I actually have another story that takes place in Crete. Okay, getting back to the story. So, um, there are three of these, um, Gorgon sisters, but two of them are immortal. They cannot be slain. The third one is mortal, and that is, uh, Medusa. Now... Perseus has to go slay Medusa, and he's not really sure how he's going to go about this. So he, you know, he sort of wanders off and he prays to Athena and he says, you know, help me. How, how am I going to slay uh, the Gorgon? Athena appears to him and gives him some advice and a few neat little trinkets from the gods. So for one thing, she I don't know why she doesn't just tell him where Medusa is, but she says, go find the Grey Sisters. Right. They they know where Medusa is. Uh, and then she said she gives him a, a polished mirror shield uh, so that he can look in the reflection of the shield and not have to look directly at Medusa. Right. I was going to describe the Gorgons. So the Gorgons historically uh, were actually viewed as as hideous uh, creatures. They had snakes for hair. That's what everyone remembers. They had fangs, lolling tongues and beards uh, in many depictions uh, and were generally considered to be horrific and frightening. And actually, it's their horrific supernatural ugliness is actually what turns people to stone. Just, they don't have to look at you. Just seeing the face of a Gorgon is bad enough that you will turn to stone from the sheer ugliness of it, uh, is how the ancient Greek sources describe it. So, uh, Perseus has his mirror shield. He's given a wicked awesome sword. Uh, he's given Hermes's um, winged sandals so he can fly around, which... He does for the rest of the story. Uh, and he is given a helmet from Ares that if you put the helmet on, or I think it's Hades' helmet? I forget. I think it's Hades' helmet, actually. And if you put the helmet on, it turns you invisible, right? A helmet of invisibility. So he's got these items uh, in a bag, right? <laughs> given a bag and told, okay, cool. Now you, you have everything you need. Go seek the Grey Sisters. So Perseus flies off and he finds, um, I'm going to bring back our campfire now. So he goes off and he finds the Grey Sisters, right? And the Grey Sisters are actually siblings of the uh, are actually siblings of the Gorgons, right? They they have the same parents, and they are these old hags. They're crones, and they have one eye that they pass between them, so that each one can see while it has the eye, and then they share the eye between the three of them. So Perseus shows up and he steals the eye and says, I won't give it back to you unless you tell me where the island of the Gorgons is. So they tell him how to find the island of the Gorgons. But then he thinks, hmm, they might try to stop me. So he throws the eye in the ocean, which uh, <laughs> our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so he flies off and he goes to the Isle of the Gorgons. And uh, the cool thing is that Perseus is a thinking man's hero, so he doesn't go in and fight a huge epic battle. He just slips on the invisibility helm, waits for them to fall asleep, looks in his shield and sneaks up on Medusa and decapitates her, right? Throws the head in the bag, flies off. Uh, you're probably wondering at this point in the story what the heck this has to do with constellations, but I am getting there. So, but I like to tell the whole story. I think it's a great story. Perseus is flying home, right? He's slain Medusa. And one thing that happens is Perseus chops off Medusa's head. And you may or may not have heard this part of the story, but from the stump of Medusa's neck um, is born Pegasus, the winged horse of Greek mythology. And Pegasus has a brother named Creseor. But what's interesting about Creseor is that we know basically nothing about him. There are no myths about Creseor. Um, there are no real descriptions of them. Uh, who, who knows? Who knows what's about Creseor? Creseor's name means he has a golden sword, and that's everything we know about Creseor. And, and we know that he's the brother of Pegasus, so cool. All right, so Pegasus, maybe he's a winged horse too. Who knows? Uh, with, maybe he's holding the sword in his teeth. I don't know. 
<laughs> Zoro's hoof, right? But um, Perseus flies home, and as he's flying home, uh, he sees this beautiful, beautiful woman chained to a rock at the edge of the sea, right? And she appears to be in distress, right? So he swoops down and he says, you know, what's going on? And she explains that she is Andromeda. And she is the princess of Ethiopia. And her parents are the king and queen of Ethiopia, named Cepheus and Cassiopeia. Don't ask me why all these Ethiopians have Greek names, but they are the royal family of Ethiopia. And uh, she explains to Perseus, um, presumably while he's undoing her chains, I don't know, but she explains to Perseus that her mother, Cassiopeia, had bragged that Andromeda was more beautiful than the Nereids, the sea nymphs, right? And this had angered Poseidon. So Poseidon had sent a sea monster um, to go and attack uh, Ethiopia from the sea and wreak havoc along the coast. And that the only way to get this monster to stop was if they sacrificed Andromeda by chaining her to a rock and he would eat her and spare everyone else, right? Uh, If this plot sounds familiar, by the way, this is more or less the plot of... Clash of the Titans is based on the Perseus story, except in the movie they refer to this creature as a kraken, but kraken's from Norse mythology. This monster's name is Cetus, um, which is also a word that means whale, but in ancient Greece would have more generally meant a sea monster, right? So uh, Cetus appears, and Perseus fights an epic battle. He's flying about, slashing, stabbing, whatever, um, and slays this sea creature and frees Andromeda and takes her with him, which is nice, right? Um, On his way home, at one point he encounters uh, Atlas, the giant who holds up the sky, and I forget why, but they have some kind of a falling out, and Perseus pulls the head of the bag, turns him to stone, and keeps going. And this is the origin of Mount Atlas in Greece. So Perseus eventually gets home, and he gets home in time to see Polydectes has kidnapped his mom and is getting ready to marry her against her will. And Perseus says, hey, I brought your gift. Look. And he pulls out Medusa's head and turns Polydectes and all of his uh, loyal guards and stuff to stone. I'm going to assume he told his mom to look away or something. I don't know. But he turns everyone else to stone, frees his mom. Happy ending to the story. Except if that's the ending of the story, you're probably wondering, what about the prophecy? Right? Wasn't there a prophecy that Perseus was supposed to kill Acrisius? Well, he does. So what happens is Perseus uh, goes on to compete in uh, Olympic Games. And Acrisius, he ends up reconciling with Acrisius. Acrisius says, look, man, about that whole locking you in a box thing, sorry about that. Lapse in judgment, my bad. Uh, <laughs> they make up and Perseus uh, is competing in the games and Acrisius comes to watch the games. And Perseus throws the discus. And he gets caught by the wind, and it hits Acrisius in the head and kills him. So there's the fulfillment of the prophecy. And now I'm going to bring up Outer Space real fast. I'm going to check the chat real fast and see. Um, uh, people say I could talk about things and it's entertaining. Awesome. I'm glad you guys are entertained, man. Uh, I, this is a definite break from our usual talk about, like, Supernovae and stuff. But hopefully you guys enjoy the, uh, the different format, if, if only for tonight. So, oh, and the, man, that's already where I needed to be, too. So, the reason why this story is cool is because several characters from this story all appear in the sky together. It's the story I know of with the most constellations all in one place, right? And we even like to call them the Perseus constellations because of the fact that they are all in this piece of sky together. So, first of all, we have, I'm going to put the characters on here as well. Perseus is right here. And Perseus is a constellation. Cassiopeia and Cepheus, the king and queen of Ethiopia, or, or Cepheus king, Cassiopeia queen of Ethiopia, are also constellations. Cass is the easiest to find, and, and we astronomers sometimes we just call her Cass. Um, these, this sort of M shape or W shape of stars, um, it's it's a, one of the circumpolar constellations, so it's always around the North Pole. Uh, so if you look to the north, and you find a big M, and these are all fairly bright stars. So in this software, the size of the dot refers to the brightness of the star. So you can see this is all pretty bright. Cassiopeia is a very bright constellation. 
and you can use it to find the others that I'm gonna, about to talk about. So Cassiopeia and Cepheus, um, and of course their daughter Andromeda. And if the name Andromeda sounds familiar, you might have heard of the Andromeda Galaxy, which is M31, which is right here. You can find it by using the tall part of the Cassiopeia M, shoot through it like an arrow through a bow, a bow until you hit this star Mirac, and then hop back to two stars, right? Boom, boom, and then that's about where this is. And it's a really cool telescope uh, target, but again, that's not the focus tonight. Um, Pegasus is here, right? Pegasus born from the stump of Medusa's neck, also a constellation, and even the sea monster, Cetus, is a constellation. So all these constellations together are what we call the Perseus constellations. And that's why Perseus is probably one of my favorite star stories. Uh, and just one of my favorites in general. I think it's probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Greek myth. I absolutely love the story of, of uh, Perseus. I'm going to take a quick look at the chat. Uh, let's see here. My dad's uh, my dad's in the chat, so if you see Charlie Mark, that's my dad. Uh, he's he's says he can see Cass. Yeah, it's in the sky tonight, right? Um, I've shown Cassiopeia from downtown Jacksonville. It is a very bright, very easy one to see. All right, well... With that out of the way, uh, again, the, the purpose tonight is I'm just going to tell stories. So that was the story from Greece, right? That was the story of Perseus. And again, I just want to remind everybody, now that we have a lot more people uh, watching the show, if you have uh, a story that you're interested in, or even just like a topic, so you can even th throw in the chat and be like, are there any stories about, you know, such and such constellation, or the sun, or the moon, or whatever you're interested in. Again, I like to have this show be a constellation. Uh, Dad says he's following along outside. Cool. So he's actually finding these same constellations. I will say some of them, um, um, actually, no, other than Cetus, I often have a hard time finding Cetus, but the rest of the Perseus uh, and Cepheus is a bit dim, but the rest of the Perseus constellations are fairly easy to find um, in the sky, right? Pegasus identified easily by that big square, right? We call it the Great Square of Pegasus. Um, these four stars, actually, one of the stars belongs both to Pegasus and to Cassio or Andromeda, I should say. Um, and you see here, you see how she's chained up. Here's another interesting thing uh, for you guys. So Perseus, of course, is this constellation. Um, Medusa's head is assumed to be over here in the constellation, and this star, Algol, this really let me zoom in on it. This bright star right here called Algol. Um, one of its many historical names is the Demon Star. Um, it's actually been called the Demon Star in history. And different cultures around the Mediterranean um, have similar stories about a hero slaying some kind of a monster and holding its head. And Algol is often traditionally associated with that creature's eye. And Algol is a variable star. So every few days, Algol will dim noticeably and come back. And that is, um, some versions of the story have it that that's sort of the, the demon winking at you. And since Medusa is often associated with, like, don't look at her or you'll, or you'll turn to stone, that kind of ties in with, like, the whole evil eye idea. And so Algol is, is sometimes called the demon star. Uh, so that's pretty Halloween for you there. All right, uh, let's see here. What story should I tell next? Uh, tell you what, I'm going to tell a quick one, right? We just had a big, long story. Why don't I tell a nice, short one? Um, and that is going to be the story of Orihime and Hikaboshi. Um, this story is also called uh, Cowherd and Weaver Girl, and they have different names in Chinese. Uh, Orihime and Hikaboshi are the... Um, are the uh, Japanese names for the characters. I'm going to delete the lines real fast because they're not going to be helpful to us in this story since these constellations are the Greek constellations and this story is from China. So the story goes that once upon a time, uh, the emperor of heaven, right? He had a daughter uh, named, uh, make sure I get them right. Or he, Hikaboshi. Hmm. Let me find out real fast. Which one is which? I always confuse which one is which. I want to make sure. OK. 
Okay. Sorry about this. I uh, I totally blanked on which one's which, and I want to. Okay, Orihime is the daughter. Gotcha. So, uh, Orihime is the Weaver girl, and Hikaboshi is the cowherd. Cool. So the king of the emperor of all heaven, right? The king of all heaven has a daughter, and her name is Orihime. And Orihime is a weaver. She weaves fabric, right? She weaves silks and makes such beautiful fabrics. And her father just absolutely loves the fabrics that she makes. And she loves that it makes him so happy uh, to make these, these various things. And she also weaves the clouds and the sky and, and all the wonderful things. And uh, because her father loves the garments that she makes so much and she loves pleasing him so much, she spends all of her time weaving, right? She, she doesn't rest. She just weaves all the time. She's eating her meat, eating her meals at her weaving dinghy, whatever you call that deal. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember what it's called. You know the one where you, you do the thing. Um, she spends all of her, uh, that's, that's the quality storytelling you guys are here for, the doing the thing. But she spends all of her time weaving, right, day long. And one day she starts to get kind of sad because... She starts to think, I will never meet a nice young man and get married, right? And her father notices, oh, and I should point out, so her father is Deneb, right? And she is the star Vega, right? Uh, actually, I don't think Deneb is mentioned in the myth, but since there are three bright stars here, I like to imagine that Deneb is the father. So he comes and he says, you know, what's wrong? And she says, well, I, you know, I really love weaving all these things, but I just... I'm, I'm sad because I've never met a nice young man and I'm not going to get married. And so he says, well, this will not do. You know, we need to find a nice young man for you to marry. So he, he goes off and he finds um, Hikaboshi. Hikaboshi is the celestial cow herd. He herds the celestial cows. Right? There's cows in the sky. You got to make sure someone's taking care of them. And that's Hikaboshi's job. And Hikaboshi is the star Altair, right? I'm just going to double check real fast and make sure I don't have that backwards. Uh, well, I'm going to stick with it for now. If I get it backwards, someone's going to tell me in the chat and I'll correct it. So Altair is uh, Hikaboshi. And so uh, they, uh, you know, he goes, he finds Hikaboshi and he says, okay, come across the Celestial River, which is the Milky Way, and meet my daughter. So Hikaboshi comes and meets Orihime, and they fall madly, head over heels, unbelievably fairy tale in love, right? Just absolutely gobsmacked in love. And they get married and they spend all of their time together because Orihime apparently doesn't know how to manage her time, right? She's either weaving incessantly or staring into her husband's eyes incessantly. Um, I, she has problems, right? So Orihime is, you know what? At the beginning of this video, I said I was going to be respectful to the stories. Alum, that's what it's called. Uh, so I'm trying to be respectful to the story. So she is just completely obsessed with Hikaboshi and likewise. And so they spend all their time together and the weaving doesn't get done, right? There's no one weaving the, the clouds. Uh, there's no one weaving the beautiful fabrics. And the celestial cows are just running all over the sky, just running roughshod, completely uncontained across the heavens. So, uh, you know, the king says, well, this will not do, right? And so he goes to his daughter and he says, that's it. Hikaboshi, you've got to go across the river. Orihime, you're staying put here. And I forbid you two to see each other. It got out of hand. Uh Fair enough, right? So they separate, but then Orihime starts crying. And so the king of all heaven realizes his daughter is sad, and he goes, okay, I realized that was a little bit harsh. Here's the deal. One day out of the year, you guys can cross the bridge over the river and meet, right? She's overjoyed. The day comes, they cross the bridge, they spend their whole day together looking into each other's eyes, and they go home and they're sad for another whole year. One year, the time comes for them to meet, 
and it rains really hard that day. And the Celestial River, which is the Milky Way, floods to the point where it's not safe to cross the bridge. And so Orihime is stuck on one side. Hikaboshi is stuck on the other. And Orihime starts crying. And some magpies see that she's sad. And they come and they say, why are you sad? And she says, well, my husband, Hikaboshi, is on the other side of that river. And I can only see him one day out of the year. And now it's raining and I won't even get to see him until next year. Right? So the magpies decide they're going to help her out. Right? So the magpies form a bridge across the Celestial River so that Orihime can walk across the magpies and Hikaboshi and they can meet. Right? And... This is the story of Orihime and Hikiboshi, and that this is what basically goes on from then on. And there's a festival that they have in Japan every year, um, which is supposed to celebrate the one day that these two can be together, right? The one day that Orihime and Hikiboshi can, can meet and be together. But if it rains really hard on that day, they call that rain on that day the tears of Orihime, because it's re- recalling when she was so sad and the magpies helped her out. So that's the story of Orihime and Hikaboshi. Oof, we're down to three viewers, man. Maybe not everybody likes these stories. We'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that story. Uh, again, like Emar Club says, if you're liking, hit that like button, subscribe. Um, and everyone's being really quiet in the chat, so I don't know if you guys are just enjoying the stories or... Uh, or what, but again, uh, if you are here, you are hanging out, definitely feel free to take part in the chat, throw in some stories from your own culture that you might know, or, you know, drop in anything that you guys are interested in hearing. I've got a few more uh, of these stories, like I said, I can go until 9.30, that's kind of the idea tonight. Um, If you came here uh, looking for an explanation of how stars form, that's every other live stream. (laughs) Tonight is the uh, storytelling live stream. Um... Let's see. I'll tell you what. I'll put it to you guys. I have a couple of uh, stories that I love to tell. And I, and I might, honestly, I might just get through all of them tonight. But um, do you guys want to hear about um, the moon princess? Uh, the wives of the sages? Or um, Fallen Star? The, the Cheyenne uh, story of Fallen Star? Which of those sounds interesting? Actually, Teresa, are you still in the chat? Because I do have a story here from uh, from the Philippines that's actually kind of interesting uh, that I can tell, and then you can tell me that I'm telling it wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, and we got to vote for the wives of the sages. Cool, cool. So, um, okay, uh, Charlie Mike wants to hear about the the wives of the sages. So, um, this one I mentioned earlier in the in the night that some of these are from a living religious tradition. This story is from Hindu tradition. So um, I don't know a lot about its place in Hinduism. Uh, And again, we'll try to tell the story with as much respect as possible. Um, My purpose tonight is not to get into anybody's religion, but just to tell what I think are wonderful stories about the the stars. I really like this story. uh, And so I'm going to tell it. and this is one that I have found a few different versions of. So if this version differs from the one that you know, you know, by all means, tell me about it in the chat. You know, that's that's always interesting to hear the different different versions. So this story is let's see, we got to go north. Here we go north. Drop the lines in there real fast. Ah, no wonder it was below the horizon. Okay, one of the cool things about this software is I can time travel. Here we go. Cool. Here we have the seven stars that make up what we like to call the Big Dipper in the Western world. Um, Also called the Plow in the UK, Ursa Major, the Big Bear, etc. So in this story, these seven stars represent um, the Saptarishi, the seven great sages. These are uh, historical great sages that are said to be um, like the seven greatest sages of all time, from my understanding. Um, and they have names, which I can look up. Let's see here. 
And actually, I'll, let me see if I can pull them up on uh, Wikimedia Commons real fast, and then we'll definitely have their names. Saptarishi. No, okay, I'm just gonna Google it real fast and just get their names. Okay, so here we go. And I'm gonna try to point them out for you guys. So Alcade is Brigu. Uh Mizar is Vishishta, and he's well they're all important to the story, but he's gonna come up in the story. Uh the next one is Angiras, and then Atri is this one, and then uh, Pelastia, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing these names, is this one, uh, Pulaha is Merak, and then Kratu, Kratu is this one. At least those are the names that came up my, in my quick Google search, right? These are the seven sages. And the story goes that the seven sages were all married. They had seven wives. Uh, not each of them. Each of them had one wife for a total of seven. So the, the seven Saptarishi and their seven wives. And uh, one day the Saptarishi did what's called a yagna. It's a, a fire ceremony. You have a, a, There's like a fire and it's a sacred uh, ritual in Hinduism uh, that I don't know the specifics of, but it does involve a fire. And so they're sitting there doing this uh, fire ceremony in front of the fire. And the god of fire, Agni, through the flames, sees the Saptarishi and their wives. And he sees that their wives are beautiful. They are just stunningly beautiful, and he's completely smitten with them. He also sees that they're married. And so this bums him out. And so he realizes he can't be with them, and so he kind of goes off into the forest to be alone. Now... Another goddess, Svaha, is smitten with Agni. So what she does is she um, transforms herself to appear like the wives of the Saptarishi, each one in turn, and seduces Agni. But the wife of Vishishta, whose name is Arundhati, is so faithful to her husband that Svaha is unable to take on her appearance. It's like a supernatural level of of wifely faithfulness. And so Svaha only imitates six of the seven wives. And from this union, um, six sons are born, and they are then later combined into a single god uh, named Murugan. That's one name for him. He's got, he has a few names. The one I can remember is Murugan. Uh, now the rumor goes around back to the Saptarishi that their wives have been unfaithful. And so they divorce them. And you can find the six wives in the sky if we slide on over to, oh, well, okay, not in the sky here because this is the wrong time of year. Let me take us to the right time of year. Here they are in the form of the Pleiades, right? But if you recall, there was one wife who was so faithful to her husband that Svaha could not take on her appearance, right? So she did not get divorced. And that wife's name is Arundhati. She was the wife of Vishishta. And if you look closely, there she is. So in this story, this is why the seven sages all appear alone except Vishishta, who has his loyal wife, next to him as the star Alcor. Now, what's really interesting about this story is I learned the story. I thought the story was fantastic. Um, and I was talking to a member of our club named Prasanna. And I was like, hey, this is a story. Right? This is really cool. And he said, yeah, obviously he knows that story. He's from India. And he said, he told me something I didn't know about. And he said that in weddings in India, especially in South India, it's common for the new couple to look in the sky and try to find Mizar and Alcor, right? Because, uh, you know, may the wife of this marriage be as faithful as Arundhati, right? And so that's that's a, um, a common uh, thing in 
uh, weddings in South India. And then Prasanna left uh, because he said that he, he's been to a lot of these weddings. And he says half the time it's like daytime and they're looking the wrong direction. And he just thought that was really funny. I thought that was pretty funny. But I do think it's really interesting that this bit of astronomy and star lore is preserved in the wedding traditions of South India. Now, having told that story, I'm going to turn around and tell a more popular story because Prasada said that that is a story. And actually, I even I was curious to see if I could find a source for it. And it's actually mentioned in the Mahabharata. So um, I found there's a great website, by the way, called Sacred Texts that has the full text translated into English of several of the world's greatest epics and literary works. And of course, Sacred Texts, as the name implies. Um, and so I read that section of the Mahabharata there and that contains his story. Um, but Prasada said there's actually a more popular story about the Pleiades. So you get a bonus story with this story, right? So Prasada told me that um, this story goes that one day uh, the god Shiva opened his third eye and six flames shot out of his third eye and became six small boys, each one in a lotus flower, and then they were immediately carried off by the wind. Uh and then they wound up in a river. I'm trying to remember exactly how it goes. They wind up in a river and they drift down the stream. And a group of young women find these boys and they take care of them. Uh, Shiva ends up finding out where the boys are. And the women are rewarded for, their, um, for being such dutiful stewards of these boys by being turned into the Pleiades. And then just like in the other, in the other story... Those six boys are combined, and they become the god Murugan. And Prasna was telling me, Prasna is from a part of India called Tamil Nadu, and he was telling me that in Tamil Nadu, this story is really popular, and Murugan is seen as like the Tamil, um, like patron god. He's he's like a cultural god of the Tamil people, and is said to have given them their name and their language, and so he's often called the Tamil god. So that's the bonus story. Uh, on the, the wives of the sages is the story of uh, these six uh, boys that came out of Shiva's third eye and then became this God. Uh, I'm going to tell, uh, I'm going to tell the story again. I hopefully Teresa's here. I got a great uh, Filipino story and it's real short. So I'm going to tell it real fast. So let me bring back my, uh... Oh, Cindy's here. What's up, Cindy. Hey, there's no problem being late. These uh, these streams are two hours long, and that's partly so that people can come and go as they want to, and so people can listen to them later. Um, I, there's a lot of people I know that I tell them about about my streams, and they watch them after the fact. Um, so, Cindy, to, to recap, tonight is about star stories, what we call star lore. These are, these are myths, legends, folklore, even religious stories about the, the sun, the moon, the constellations, that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, tonight I'm breaking from my usual, uh, pattern of talking about scientific ideas. And then tonight we're just storytelling. It's the Halloween special, as you can see by my, uh, costume as generic wizard who does not belong in any way, is not in any way affiliated with the intellectual property of the Tolkien estate. Uh, so, um, I put it to the audience earlier, what story to listen to. I talked about the moon princess the Wives of the Sages, um, Fallen Star. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? I'm, there's a really good story. Um, nah, I just had it. No, I'm going to tell the Moon Princess. That's a really good one. Okay. So this one's about the moon, so I'm just going to bring up um, a visual of... Oh, there's the... Yeah, I don't have permission for this video or for that image. Sorry. Um, go back to no restrictions here. Moon. There's got to be a royalty-free moon image. Here we go. Cool. You know what? Actually, I'm gonna. I'm curious though. Do we have a royalty-free image of Chang'e? Uh, yeah. Okay. There we go. I'm just gonna have this picture up in the background. According to Wikimedia, there's no restrictions on this picture. So, all right. So this is the story of the Moon Princess, or right, the Moon Goddess. So. There are so many versions of this story. I'm just going to say right out of the gate, there are so many versions of the story. And the one I'm going to tell tonight is none of them. <laughs> because uh, I have 
read several different versions of the story and there's bits I really like about several different ones. So when I tell the story, I like to tell my version of it where I combine my favorite parts of the stories that I like the best. So this is Dave's version of this story. Um, but here's how I'm going to tell it. So a long time ago in the ancient days, there used to be more than one son. In fact, there were 10 of them. No, sorry, there were nine of them. And every day, one of the nine sons would take turns rising in the sky. And one day, they all decided to rush the sky at once. They didn't wait their turn. We just had a sun bonanza. There was, there was nine, of, nine suns all in the sky together, and their light was so bright, and their heat just blasted the earth, and it threatened to destroy everything, right? Crop, crops were withering. People were fainting from heat. Wildfires were starting. It was a, it was a huge mess. And uh, the great legendary archer Hoi realized he had to do something, and he had to do something quick. So he climbed up on a tall mountain, drew his bow, and shot eight of the suns out of the sky. One after the other. Shot them all out of the sky. So there was only one sun left, and that is why now there is only ever one sun. Um, now, he was rewarded for this. The, uh, the great emperor of heaven... Uh, appeared to him and and said, I can't thank you enough for solving the problem of these sons. Um, So he he said, I'm going to give you a gift. And he gave him uh, one dose of the elixir of immortality. Now, when I first heard the story, I'm thinking elixir, I'm thinking a potion, but actually traditionally it's a pill. And there's like a a gourd that you keep it in, uh, in Taoist tradition. And this story is from China. So he's given this pill. He's given the pill of immortality. Uh, and so, uh, the emperor of heaven says, take that pill. You'll become an immortal God and you'll come live with us in heaven. Uh, Hoi bows to him and tells him he's very you know, grateful. Thank you so much. And he goes home. Uh, and he's sad. A lot of these stories involve somebody being sad, but he comes home and his wife, Chang'e, sees that he's sad. And she says, why are you sad? And he says, well, you noticed this morning there was a few more sons than normal. I took care of that. Uh, and then the Jade Emperor of Heaven gave me the Elixir of Immortality. She says, okay, I'm missing the part where you're sad. And he says, he gave me one. One pill. Not two. Right? And uh, he explains to Chang'e that he doesn't want to take the pill. Because if he does, he will become an immortal god. And he will have to leave the earthly world and go to the court of heaven. And Chang'e doesn't want to take the pill for the same reason. She doesn't want to leave him. So they make an agreement. They say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep it somewhere safe, and we're never going to use it. We're just going to live out our lives. And then finally, when the time comes and one of us is dying, whoever that is, we'll go ahead and take the pill then, right? Uh, and then go on to, to live in heaven. So they do that and they just, they spend their lives and they don't ever take the pill. It sits on a shelf somewhere. They keep it safe and they go about their lives and they grow steadily older. And, uh, Hoi, of course, being the great legendary archer attracts students, right? And so he teaches archery and he, he teaches, um, you know, all these great archers to, to, to do great things. And he has a student named Fang Mong and Fang Mong somehow, uh, versions differ, discovers that this pill exists, right? And one day, Ho Yi, of course, slaying the the eight sons, that's not the only great feat that this legendary archer ever did, right? So one day he's off slaying demons and having another adventure. It's another story that you can tell. Uh, Fong Mong takes that opportunity to break into his house, to steal the elixir of immortality. But when he breaks in, Chang E is there. And uh, Fang Mong breaks in, looks over, eyes the pill. Chang'e looks at him, sees that he's looking at the pill, and she realizes he's going to kill me and take this pill. So either he kills me and becomes an immortal, or I take the pill and become immortal. So, reluctantly, but in the moment, doing what she has to do, she just, oh, just immediately takes that pill and 
She's a, oh, that was loud. And then boom, she is a goddess, right? Full blown immortal goddess, radiant, shining the whole bit. Fong Mong retreats and she immediately cannot stay on the earth any longer. But she doesn't want to leave Ho Yi because she loves him so much. So what she does is she flies up and she doesn't go all the way to heaven. She stops and she stays on the moon so that she can look down on Ho Yi the rest of his life. Ho Yi comes home, discovers what's happened, and he's sad, but he goes inside and he gets a table and he lays the table out uh, under the light of the moon, right? Because he realizes where she is. And he goes and he gets her favorite cakes and he puts them out on the table, right? Uh, for her to see all her favorite things. And he starts doing this once a year for the rest of his life. Uh, eventually, Ho Yi grows old, he dies, etc. Uh, Chang'e, of course, remains, and she remains on the moon. And this story is the reason for the uh, yearly moon festival that they have in China. Um, the exact date of the festival varies regionally. Um, let me see if I can find one of these cool things, though. Yeah, now we're talking. And part of the fun of the moon festival is these guys... Uh, this is a, okay, apparently this is a Vietnam version of it, is what that little description says. Um, but these, this is a moon cake. Uh, these cakes are, they have egg in them. I've never tried one. Apparently you can get them at like Asian food stores. I kind of want to go get one now and see if it's any, see if I like it. But that's the, that's the story of Chang'e, the moon princess. And uh, every year they have this big festival and people eat these cakes because this was, this was what he laid out on the table, right? These were her favorite cakes. And that's the, that's the way that I like to tell the story. Um, wonder where the suns went. Uh, I think they like crashed down into the ocean or something like that when they're slain. I, I forget the exact result of those, of those suns. And as I mentioned, there are so many different versions of this story. So um, one version is that, uh, yeah, it's a very sad love story. Um, one version of the story is that uh, Ho Yi and Chang'e actually start off as gods and Ho Yi shoots the suns out of the sky and is actually punished for it because he slew the celestial, you know, he slew these things without, uh, you know, being asked to do so, I guess. And, and so the punishment is they have to, um, they have to go to earth and become mortal and then Ho Yi actually goes on a quest to acquire uh, the elixir of immortality. Uh, one version of the story is he actually has enough for two, but then Chang'e just takes them because she's just greedy and she just takes them. But the ver again, like I said, the version I tell that's the th I like that version the best, where they love each other so much that both refuse to take the elixir. I I'm not as big a fan of the one where she just noms it down. Interestingly, there's a movie called Over the Moon. It's on Netflix. It's uh, originally it was in Mandarin, I think, and I also have it in English. Um, and it's about this story. It's about a girl who goes to the moon to meet Chang'e. And there's a great scene where uh, her family are actually debating about the different versions of the story. While eating crabs, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so... That's cool. It's, it's like a 3D animated kids movie. Check it out. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, Cindy says she saw it. Yeah, yeah. Very cool movie. All right. Well, let's see. What other stories... Oops, accidentally opening all kinds of things here. If you look at satellite view, you can see the continental shelf of the continents. Uh, oh, so, okay. He's talking about how New Zealand is is um is actually just the tips of the mountains of what used to be a bigger continent. Yeah, that happens. Uh, the UK is the same kind of thing. There used to be a continent called Doggerland or a piece of land called Doggerland that got flooded after the end of the last ice age, and the UK is just the tip. All right. Uh, let's see here. For my next story, what should I tell? Um. Let's go with, tell you what, I'm already looking at the right piece of sky for it. So let's tell a couple of stories about Orion. So first of all, the Greek version um, is that Orion is a hunter. And uh, he was uh, one of Artemis's followers. 
Um, some versions of the story have it that like Orion was the only man that Artemis ever loved, um, but that's not the general consensus in the original Greek sources. Um, Orion uh, boasted that he could slay you know any beast, and he was the greatest hunter. And the gods began to fear that he was going to wipe the earth clean of all life, all animal life anyway. Uh, and so they sent a scorpion to sting and kill him. And so this is the origin story of the constellation Orion. It's also the origin of the uh, Scorpius, the constellation Scorpius. And because they were enemies in life, they are enemies in death. And they are never in the sky at the same time. So this is the story for why you will never see Orion and Scorpius in the sky at the same time. Earlier when I was looking for the Pleiades and I was telling that story of the, of the sages, you might have seen me scroll through the sky and go, whoop, nope, it wouldn't be here. That's because I saw Scorpius and I knew that the Pleiades is near Orion, so I had to switch the time of year. Um, and, and, and if you look, if, if we look here in the uh, software and we add in the lines and the constellations, uh, there is no Scorpion. Right? Scorpius is nowhere to be found. Right? Um, if we find Orion again, if we fast forward the time, doop, 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 as soon as Orion is set, boom, here's Scorpius, right? We back up a little bit. As soon as we have Orion again, no more Scorpius, right? So they are never in the sky at the same time. Now, one thing I want to mention about Orion, though, that I think is really, really interesting, and I was reading about this before. Ooh, there we go. This is quite possibly one of, if not the oldest surviving story full you guys still see the cake oh good grief yep okay so uh again here we are with orion and add the artwork and i'll show again how um if i fast forward once twice three times a lady as soon as orion's gone they're scorpius I back up and bring back Orion. As soon as Orion starts to rise, Scorpius goes away. They are never in the sky at the same time. So what I was going to say, though, is that there is a story about Orion, and it may well be the oldest story. It is one of, if not the oldest story still told. And I'll explain why we say that. Uh, and not the specific story, but basically that there are stories all over the world that all tie together, these similar elements. So the Greek version is that Orion is this great hunter, like I mentioned, and that Orion um, is, I'll use the word infatuated, with the Pleiades. So the Pleiades, we know the Pleiades is a star cluster, but the Pleiades were also a group of sisters in Greek mythology. In fact, um, they're often called the Seven Sisters. Uh, they were the daughters of the giant at of the the titan atlas and his wife pliony now the story goes that the pleiades were not nearly so interested in orion as he was interested in them and so they ran away from him and he followed them because you know ancient times uh but then the pleiades were put into the sky and then as a, some kind of a sick joke so was orion so the Pleiades are west of Orion, which means if you fast forward the clock here, or we'll rewind a little bit and go, as time goes on, Orion chases the Pleiades through the sky and will for all eternity. Now, I said that's the Greek version of the story because there are versions of this story all over the planet, and I mean all over the planet. Um, there is a version... Uh, and I'm not sure exactly which people group, but one of the Aboriginal Australian tribes tells a story of a hunter pursuing a group of seven sisters through the sky that are associated with Orion and the Pleiades. There are similar stories in uh, Native American and First Peoples uh, folklore. Uh, again, forget the exact tribe and the exact specifics of the story, but there are versions of this story told in Siberia, right? And... The common elements are Orion is a giant, a hunter, or both. And the Pleiades are seven sisters. And oftentimes they are seven sisters, but one of them is missing. These are all very common parts of this story. So um, different versions have different excuses. And the Greek version has multiple different reasons why 
one of the Pleiades sisters is missing and which Pleiades sister it is. Um, but it's either, you know, she hid or she was ashamed or she was the one who actually liked Orion. So she didn't run away from him or like some version of why one sister is missing and you can only see six because when you look in the sky with your unaided eye, there are seven bright stars in the Pleiades, but you can only see six. So this is really curious a that so many cultures have such a similar story. And these cultures have been geographically isolated for hundreds of, for for thousands, for for over a hundred thousand years. Right. Uh, And in some cases that the cultures have been, separate isolated cultures and that so many of them have this detail that there were seven sisters minus one right in fact you might even remember and i don't think these two stories are related but it's still kind of interesting that there were seven wives but then only six became the pleiades so again seven minus one right from that uh story early with the sages What's interesting about this is that if you rewind the clock back far enough, all humans come from the same place, right? Humanity first arose in Africa and then spread out into the world. You may have heard of this. It's called Out of Africa. Now, if these cultures are, in fact, telling the same story, it would have to have originated then, right? That would be one of the one of the last points of contact between what would eventually become all these different people groups who spread out over the world, which would make this an incredibly old story. But what's interesting about it is if you take the proper motion, you know, I said I wasn't going to get scientific, but I am. If you take the proper motion of the stars in the Pleiades, meaning like the way that they're moving over time, because they are drifting over time, a hundred thousand years ago, these two stars right here, which Interestingly, are not named for either of the daughter. I don't know who named the Pleiades. They named them wrong because they included the parents as two of the seven instead of the seven names from Greek mythology. But anyway, Atlas and Pliony, these two stars used to be further apart from the perspective of the Earth. And so one theory or one hypothesis, I should say, is that this story is 100,000 years old and 100,000 years ago there was enough separation between those two stars to be able to make it out with the unaided eye. And so the original version of the story probably was some kind of a story about a hunter pursuing seven sisters. That story got retold as these cultures spread all over the earth, got worked into various mythologies. It became about Orion and and Artemis and all these different cultures. But over time, people couldn't see seven. And so different cultures came up with different stories explaining why This story has seven sisters, but you can only see six. And that's why a common element in many of these stories is that one of the sisters is missing, right? That there were seven minus one resulting in the Pleiades. Uh, I'll have to find the article I read about that and link it in the description. It was really fascinating to read. Um, And so there you go. That may well be one of the oldest stories. Uh, But now I'm going to tell another story. That takes place in the same part of the sky. And for this one, we're going to go to ancient Babylon. And an interesting thing to remember about ancient Babylon is that ancient Greece inherited a lot of star lore from ancient Babylon. So there's a lot of Greek constellations that if you look in the old sources were Babylonian constellations that the Greeks reinterpreted and recontextualized. And I'll talk a little bit about the recontextualization of this story in a second. But the Babylonian version goes like this. Um, A long time ago, there was a city called Uruk, and the king of Uruk was a man named Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh was something else, man. He was constantly getting drunk, getting into fights. Um, He was constantly, um, again, family-friendly, hugging people's wives on the wedding night um, (laughs) and claiming it was his right as king. Um, just really, really causing a problem. And the people were fed up and they prayed to the gods and said, gods, please do something about Gilgamesh, right? He's like every night he's in the bars, arm wrestling people to the death, like do something about Gilgamesh. And so the gods decide that the best solution for Gilgamesh is that he needs a buddy. That's his problem, right? He's bored. He doesn't have any friend who's his equal. He needs somebody 
who is just as ridiculous as he is. And so they create a man named Enkidu. And Enkidu is a wild man. He lives out in the wilderness. And there's a whole story about how um, the goddess Ishtar civilizes him. But we're going to sort of go over that. And so Enkidu goes into the city of Uruk. And in Uruk, he meets Gilgamesh. And uh, the very first thing that they do is get into a fight. Right? And Enkidu's like, tired of your nonsense. And they fight. And they fight and fight and fight. And they're equally matched. And they beat the living daylights out of each other. And then, just like that scene in Step Brothers, Gilgamesh is like, did we just become best friends? And Enkidu is like, yes, we did. And they are just full-on bro power from that moment on, right? And then there's uh, there's one story where um, the goddess Ishtar uh, tries to uh, seduce uh, Gilgamesh. She's like, Gilgamesh, you know, I think you're cute or whatever. And Gilgamesh is like, yeah, I know my mythology and I know what happens to your boyfriends. So no, because Ishtar has a really bad habit of like all her boyfriends die. Uh, and so she's like, uh, if, um, you know, she's not having it. She's like, oh, you know, Gilgamesh. Uh, fun fact, when I mentioned the Greeks importing a lot of this stuff, Ishtar kind of gets imported as Aphrodite. So that should give you a hint. So uh, she's, uh, she's mad at Gilgamesh, obviously, for this insult. And so she sends the bull of heaven to come and, and, you know, kill crops and cause problems and whatever. And Gilgamesh and Enkidu head out and they fight the bull of heaven and kill it. Uh, and then sacrifice it and offer it to the gods. <laughs> Please forgive us. Um, but Enkidu dies in that fight. And this is a huge turning point in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh which is a really old story, by the way, and it's really cool. But this is a big turning point. Gil uh, Enkidu dies. And it makes Gilgamesh obsess over death. And so he goes on this journey to find his ancestor, Utnapishtim, who is still alive because Utnapishtim is immortal. And Gilgamesh goes and he says, you know, why are you immortal? And uh, Utnapishtim says, well, I'll tell you the story, but it's not like it's something you can do, Right. And explains that um, in the, way back in the day, the humans were causing way too much noise. The gods couldn't handle it. And so they sent a big flood to just kill everybody. And um, the god Enlil, I think it was, had said, um, I'm going to destroy all mortals, right? all mortal life. And then one of the gods uh, warned Utnapishtim ahead of time. So he built a boat and survived the flood. So the gods like, well, okay, you're immortal there. See, I killed all the mortals, right? And so, but your children won't be. And so that's why Utnapishtim is immortal. Uh, interesting enough, this is one of the oldest versions of the flood story too. But the reason why I tell the story now is because this, uh, these two constellations, Orion and Taurus, um, to the ancient Babylonians actually represented Gilgamesh fighting the bull of heaven, right? Because Taurus was a bull, the ancient Babylonians as well. Uh, let's see here. Ooh, this is a really interesting question. So Cooper says, it makes me wonder if the North Sentinelese have that story. If you don't know about the North Sentinelese, there's um, North Sentinel Island. It's off the coast of India, I want to say. And it's one of the last uncontacted tribes. And it's famous for the fact that anytime anyone has visited the island or, you know, tried to visit the island, that the locals just kill them. And... Like, when helicopters have flown overhead, they've thrown spears at the helicopters and shot arrows at the helicopters. Uh, and the government of India has said, like, seriously, leave North Sentinel Island alone, right? So very, very little is known about the North Sentinel Uh I watched a great video on YouTube, uh, though, that went did a deep dive into the North Sentinel and it turns out there's more to that story than most people hear. And apparently it's not actually unreasonable that the people of North Sentinel Island don't like outsiders. They, they have things that happened in their past. I, I can't remember the exact story about it and I don't want to get anything wrong, but there have been contexts that have gone bad that have explained why they are so hostile now to outsiders. Um, yeah. And, and Cooper also pointing out every culture has a flood myth. Yeah. That's a very common thing, right? Is to have some kind of a story about a flood 
Uh, it's especially common around the Black Sea region uh, and the Middle East uh, and that part of the world, Middle East and, and Lower Europe. Uh, but you do see floods and stories about floods in other cultures as well. Okay, we've got about a half an hour left in the show. So let me see. I keep looking over here. I, I, I wrote down some notes about some of these stories that I don't necessarily have memorized off the top of my head. Uh, tell you what, while I'm still here at Orion, I will mention there's another story from the Yongu people in, uh, in Australia. It's one of the Aboriginal Australian tribes where they actually look at Rigel to Beetlejuice as being a canoe. And the story goes that there were these three brothers, we were right here, boom, 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 and they were of the kingfish tribe, and they were out fishing, and they kept catching kingfish. But of course, being from the kingfish tribe, it was against the law to kill and eat kingfish, so they kept throwing them back. And they were basically catch and release fishing all day, because they won't catch anything but kingfish. And eventually, this brother, represented by Alnatak, was so hungry, he just said, forget it, man, and he just ate a kingfish which is actually represented by the sword stars right down here. And this upset the gods, and they sent a water spout to launch the whole canoe into the sky. Uh, and now here they are in Orion. Uh, which I think is an interesting story. And it's also interesting that from Australia, this whole scene would be turned the other way around. So, so Rigel is actually the front of the canoe at the top. Beetlejuice is the back, and the fish is out in front of the boat over here, as viewed from Australia. All right, uh, let's see here. Here goes a good story, and it's another somewhat short one. So there's a story from the San people in Africa, um, and they tell a story. Uh, Cooper's still going on about the uh, North Sentinelese. If you guys are really curious about the North Sentinelese, man, check out the chat. Uh, Cooper's got the story. So uh, this story in, in, from San uh, tells the story of, of a long, long time ago, nighttime was pitch dark. And hunters could only go as far from their village as they could go and still return that night. Because it was so dark at night, it was dangerous to be away from your village. So you couldn't make a multi-day trip to go out and hunt. And this meant that the hunters had a hard time getting enough food to eat, right? And one night, this girl is frustrated with the situation. And she takes the ashes from the fire. And they had a fire, right? And she takes the ashes from the fire and she throws them into the sky. And the ashes streak across the sky and become the Milky Way. And then she takes the yams, the, or not the yams, the roots. Sorry, that's, um, oh man, I, I learned the name of this root and it's in the San language and it liter it has a click in it. It's a click language. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it, but it's hooing, but with a click, uh, root. I think it's like hooing, it might, might be it. I'm not sure. I don't want to get it wrong, but she takes these roots and she throws the roots into the sky, and they become the brighter stars that you see in the sky. And because of this, the stars now shine at night, and it's the hunters are able to see at night, and so it is safe to be away from the village and hunt for multiple days, and now they have plenty of food that they can hunt and they can go catch. Uh, what's cool about that, one interesting thing about that story, I was going to say what's cool about it. What's well, cool about the story is the story. Um but the way I learned about this story is um, I packed a Kickstarter for a board game that tells this story. Actually, the board game is about that story, and you um, collect light from the stars and build paths. Uh, Kickstarter's over now, but I'm still waiting for my copy of the game. Uh, and let's see. I'm going to put it to you guys again. We've got a half hour left. Um, some of these stories are longer than other ones. Uh Oh, you know what? I mentioned the Filipino story earlier that I was going to tell because Teresa was here. Don't know if she's still here, but Teresa, if you're still listening, um, I'm going to tell the uh, the Filipino one. Uh, so this one is about the sun and the moon. And this one's a, a fairly short one. So uh, the sun god, Buan, and the, or sorry, the moon, he's the moon god. And then the sun god is Ara. And they are both friends with... Uh, let me see if I can read my writing here. 
Lee Hongen. Lee Hongen, the, the wind, the north wind. And one day, um, Lee Hongen is warming by the sun, by the sun god Ara, and says, hey, I've noticed that Buwan is like encroaching on your turf, right? He shines during the day and is trying to take over the daytime as well as the night. And Ara is like, well, that can't stand. So, um, you know, Ara goes to the moon and is like, I need you to stop shining during the day, right? Respect the, respect the boundaries, respect the turf. And uh, Buwan doesn't listen. And they get into a big fight. And they start fighting bitterly and, it's, and it gets aggressive. And Ara knocks pieces off of Buwan. And now Bawan doesn't shine as brightly. Right? This is why the moon doesn't shine as brightly as the sun. And the pieces that get knocked off become the stars. All those bits, those shimmering bits, become a thousand shimmering lights. Yeah. Name of the YouTube channel. Let's see here. Oh, I got another one about Orion. I found a lot of stories about Orion. Uh, so another one that I thought was really neat, and I can say it real, I can just mention it real fast. Uh, this one is from the Namaqua people of Africa. Uh, when I was doing a lot of this, I didn't want to just say the story is from Africa or this is a Native American story, which I haven't told one yet, but I do have a, a couple I can tell. Um, because these are huge, huge continents with many, many cultures. So I wanted to make sure I, I wrote down the names of the different people groups that these stories come from. So the Namaqua say that um, that the sky god's daughters are the Pleiades, um, and their husband is Aldebaran. And that one day Aldebaran went out to hunt zebras, and here they are. There's three zebras. He shot his arrow, and it landed near the zebras. That's the sword stars right there. And now he's stuck because he dare not go and retrieve his arrows because there's a ferocious lion nearby also stalking the zebras. But he dare not come home empty-handed so here he remains, forever between the zebras and his wives, unsure of which is worse. <laughs> right? Does he, does he uh, uh, face the wrath of the lion, or does he face the wrath of six angry, hungry women? And so he's decided he's just going to sit right here and deal with none of it. Okay, uh, let's see here. Who is still here? Who is still here watching the show? I think with the last bit of the show, I might tell this um, Cheyenne one that I mentioned earlier, uh, Fallen Star. So the Cheyenne are a Native American tribe, and this is one of their stories. Uh so, uh, the Cheyenne, um, they, they have a story in, in which a uh, long time ago, there was a pair of young girls sitting outside looking at this. You know what? I'm on the right part, part of the sky for this one, too. They're sitting outside looking at the stars and making pictures, right, with their imaginations. Like, you now you find pictures in the clouds. And they start talking about the stars. And uh, the younger girl, I think it is, says, you see that really bright one there? The brightest star? She says, I would marry that star. Right? And that's a handsome star. And the two girls, I guess, giggle and they go back to bed. But then the next day, uh, they're out and about. And that same girl sees a porcupine climbing a tree. And she's like, I'm going to get that porcupine. Which... I feel like is a bad idea uh, knowing what porcupines are, but she climbs up after it and the porcupine climbs high, climbs higher and she climbs higher after it and they keep going and the tree starts to grow and her friend is calling to her from the ground. Hey, uh, the tree is growing <laughs> you know, and she ignores her and keeps chasing the porcupine and eventually she finds herself in the sky world and she meets this, you know, nice looking man. And she's like, oh, you know, goodness, who am I? And he was like, oh, I, you know, or, or where am I? And he says, oh, you're in the sky world. 
and I'm glad you finally came. I, you know, I've been looking forward to meeting you. And she's like, what do you mean? He goes, well, I heard you and your friend talking. You want to marry me, right? And she's like, well, I guess I did say that. So they get married. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, they're married. Uh, Brightest Star is her name, is, is his name. And then I think she's called, I forget, I don't remember her name, but uh, she's married to Brightest Star. And he says, you know, when I go off and I hunt and whatever, and I come back, obviously feel free to dig roots with the other uh, women of the sky. He says, but there's a particular kind of root and he shows her what it looks like. And he says, this root you shouldn't dig, right? Don't dig this one. He's like, okay. So, you know, every day he goes off and she's digging roots and you know, cooking and all the usual things. And one day she's like, I'm going to dig up that root. So she takes that root and she digs and digs and digs. And it's, it turns out to be really, really big. It's much bigger than she thought it was going to be. And eventually she finds, now she's just determined. So she's going to dig this thing out no matter what. And she finally yanks this whole thing out of the ground and it leaves a huge hole, right? Where she pulled this thing out. And when she looks through the hole, she can see the earth and she can see her tribe, right? And then she gets homesick. She decides she wants to go home. She's had her fun in the sky, but she misses her home. She misses people. She misses the earth. So she takes all of her clothing and all the fabric and everything she can find and a bunch of dry grass and all the stuff she can get from materials. And she ties them all together and makes the longest rope she can make. And uh, I should mention at this point in the story, also, she's pregnant. She's pregnant with uh, Brightest Star's uh, child. And so she takes a big log and puts it across the hole and climbs down the rope. But unfortunately, it's not actually long enough. Uh, the rope does not reach all the way to the ground. And so when she gets all the way to the bottom of the rope, she's stuck. And she hangs on as long as she can. Eventually, uh, her arms give out and she falls to the earth and dies, actually. But her son is still alive. And so um, he's rescued from her. They cut, her out of, cut him out of her. And he ends up being raised by magpies. And uh, his name is Fallen Star. And then one day when he grows up to be a man, he goes and he uh, finds other Cheyenne to go live with. And uh, he's a, he asks for food and they don't have enough food, right? And they say, um, the problem is whenever we go hunt the buffalo, there is this white crow who flies off and warns them that we're coming and we never get any buffalo. Right. And so he says, OK, I have an idea. Right. Get me a buffalo skin cloak and your two best hunters. Right. And so he, he gets the buffalo skin cloak and the two hunters. And he says, I'm going to run ahead. I'm going to try and join that buffalo herd and pretend to be a buffalo. And I want you guys to hunt me and slay me and skin me. Right. So let's bring back the campfire for now. So he runs off. And the hunters pursue him and they hunt him and they slay him and they skin him. And while they're doing this, um, that white crow sees what's happening and is like, I don't think that's really a buffalo, right? I think that's a person pretending to be a buffalo. And he flies down to get a closer look. He's like, I don't know. I'm still not convinced that's a buffalo. And he gets closer. And then Falling Star throws off the cloak and grabs him, right? Brings him down. And they kill the white crow. And now the buffalo don't see him coming. And so because of Fallen Star, now the Cheyenne can hunt the buffalo and have enough to eat. So that is the story of Fallen Star, who is the son of Sirius. And I didn't find this explicitly said in any of the myths, but it would be very appropriate if Taurus was yet again a cow and this time was actually a buffalo, right? If this was the buffalo that, that, they, that they hunted. Um... But hopefully you guys enjoyed the story of Fallen Star. Let's see here. Uh, we're coming down to the end of it. I'm going to do um, the usual housekeeping that I do near the end of these videos. And if we have any time left, I might tell another story or two uh, of the ones I can think of. Anyway, I've told a lot of the stories so far tonight. So, okay. Um... As I mentioned before, let me bring back the visuals. I am the membership director of the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. Our website is called nephis.org, 
And this channel, A Thousand Shimmering Lights, is normally an astronomy channel where we talk about um, the science of astronomy. Um, but again, hopefully you guys enjoyed tonight's Halloween episode. Uh, also, don't tell anyone to do my costume. <laughs> Those of you who know me, right? Uh, you guys got a sneak peek at what I'm going to be for Halloween. But anyway, um, our website is nevis.org. There it is. And it finally loaded. Um, and if you are in the Jacksonville area and you're interested in astronomy, you should absolutely check us out. Um, we have uh, memberships as well. If you want to be a member of the club, you can fill this all out. Select your membership type. Um, we have students and seniors for $20, individuals for $40, or a family for $50. And what we consider a family is any two adults and whoever they happen to be in charge of. We don't get nitpicky about what a family is. Uh, we want every family to be a part of our family. And we have a benefactor level at $75. And it is literally no different from the individual level. You don't get anything different. Um, it's just a way that some club members have said, hey, I want to give more. And that's a way to give more. But don't feel like you got to do it. Don't feel like you're missing out if you don't do it. The only thing that benefactors really get is your name is mentioned in our monthly newsletter. Kind of cool. And like I said, and, and you're supporting the club, right? But really, it's it's up to you. Um, there's not really any difference. So that's what that is. Uh, and of course, uh, main thing, if you're, you know, whether or not you're interested in joining the club, I highly encourage you, if you live in the Jacksonville area, to check out our calendar and see the upcoming events that we have in particular. Um in particular, our Hannah Park stargazes that we have um, on the Saturday closest to last quarter moon, or sorry, first quarter moon every month. Um, if you don't track the lunar phases, it's easier to keep track by looking at the calendar. Um, we're double booked on this next one, like I mentioned at the beginning of the of the of the uh, session tonight. Uh, so I'm not going to be at Hannah Park this time, but we will definitely have people there. But, uh, you know, we'll see if we're double booked in December. We are not, so I might be at that one. Uh, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Um, and I do a, a laser pointer tour of the sky. I show people the constellations. I do tell some of the stories, but I also get into the scientific stuff, talk about star formation, nebulae, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a ton of... And I show people, literally, with a beam. You can see into the sky with a laser. I say laser pointer, but it's not like... I mean, it is like a laser show. You can see the beam. And I draw the constellations for people to see. You can actually see me drawing out the outlines of the constellations. Uh, and we have telescopes. And we have telescopes set up for everybody to come and look through the telescopes at star clusters, nebulae, sometimes even other galaxies, planets for sure, the moon. Uh, it, is, it is a really good time. Uh, and that is our club. So with that out of the way, let's, uh, let's return to our campfire. There we go. Nice. Ooh, toasty warm. Oh, it should be this way. There we go. Uh, now we, now I'm warming myself by the... Oh, it went out. <laughs> or or it, it, it paused anyway. Again, whoever's video this is of the campfire that I am completely ripping off, I apologize. Um, I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, let's see. Is there anything... Uh, first of all, again, do you guys have any stories that I don't know about? Uh, or are there any topics that you want to hear another story about? The sun, the moon, the stars... Uh, anything like that. I, like I said, I've got a bunch of them. Hmm. Let me think here. You know what I'll do? Uh, it's not a specific story, but I have somehow managed to go this entire time without mentioning Norse mythology. So let me correct that now. All right. So um, some of these have stories behind them. Some of them don't. But I'm going to quickly rattle off in the last uh, uh, half, you know, 15 minutes, some Norse myths. So for one, um, some sources say that um, in the old Norse star lore, Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka um, were seen as Fre uh, Freya's or Frigg's distaff. Uh, Frigg and Freya are said by, Stor by Snorri Sturluson to be two separate goddesses. But some scholars suspect they were originally the same goddess um, because their names are similar, but also their husbands are literally Freya's husband is Othar and Frigg's husband is Odin. So, you know, um, but either way, and a lot of things about one get confused with the other, right? So is it Frigg's distaff? Is it Freya's distaff? Who knows? 
Uh, the distaff, if you don't know, is the staff that women would use to uh, spin thread, right? So you have a spindle and the staff. I don't know exactly how it works, but that's what a distaff is. Um, the term is the term is uh, sometimes used in English, although this is really an archaism to refer to somebody's distaff uncle, for example, or distaff grandfather, or their um, what's the other one? Spear, right? Spear uncle or spear whoever. And what that is is the spear side of your family is your father's side, and your distaff side of your family is your mother's, because the spear is a man's implement historically. And the distaff is the woman's implement historically. And so these are Freya, Freya or Freig's distaff, which I suppose would make, you know, the whole constellation of Orion, Frigg or Freya, but I couldn't find any support for that, so I don't want to claim it. Um, one uh, story that I will get into a little bit is the story of... Nope, that's Persion. Where are they? There we go. Castor and Pollux, right? So uh, there's a there's a story that um, the 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 Jotun, which the Jotun are, you often see it translated as frost giant, but I've always felt the better, more accurate term would be Titan, because they're kind of like the same thing as the gods, and they intermarry with the gods, and they're more like the Greek concept of Titans. Um, but there's a Titan named Theazi, and I'm trying to remember. Uh, see, this is why this is the story coming out near the end, because I'm trying to remember how the story goes. And I'm kicking myself for forgetting a Greek myth. But um, there was a reason why Loki was... Or no. Oh, right. I think it was about the meat of poetry. Theazi had the meat of poetry. Odin went and stole it. Turned himself into a bird and started flying for Asgard. Right? Uh, into an, e an eagle. And Theazi turned himself into an eagle and started chasing him. And Odin knew that if he could just get to Asgard, that the Ozzy was screwed, right? Because the gods would not permit a giant to enter Asgard. And he's flying, he's flying, he's flying, and he's getting to the walls. And somehow the gods know, okay, that's Odin, that's the Ozzy. Maybe they can just supernaturally recognize them. And they get a big fire ready. Odin flies over, and then they stoke the fire into huge flames so that when the Ozzy gets through, he gets burnt. And they slay him. They kill him right there. Okay, so they've killed Theazi and rescued Odin, but now Theazi's daughter, Skadi, is upset, right? So she goes to the gods and she demands what's called Weregild. So Weregild literally means man gold, and kind of like werewolf is a man wolf. And what Weregild was is it was a thing that was done in, um, in Nordic uh, Scandinavian culture where... Uh, if you if you committed manslaughter or even murder, um, you could um, compensate the family of the person you killed. They could demand money as compensation. That was called weregild, right? And you would have to pay that money as a penalty for killing that member of their family. And so Scotty demands a weregild, but instead of money, she demands three things. She says, um, "I want you to." Give me a husband from among the gods, make me laugh, and honor my father in some way. So the way they make her laugh is Loki does something really funny that I'm not going to say on the channel, um, but it's hilarious. And it makes Scotty laugh and it makes all the gods laugh. Um, the way they get her a husband is actually kind of interesting. They basically, um, they line up. Uh, several of the bachelor gods and they put them behind a screen where the only thing you can see is their feet and they tell her to choose her husband based on his feet and she sees a beautiful pair of feet and says surely those are Baldur's feet and it turns out that the feet of the sea god Njord because the sea washes his feet daily <laughs> and so she stuck with him uh, and then the way they honor her father is they put his eyes in the sky and so that's Castor and Pollux or it's suspected that they are. The problem is these old sources are like, and then they put the eyes in the sky. And that's it. It doesn't say where they are. So we have to kind of guess. But this is a very prominent pair of stars that would have been very familiar to the ancient Norse. They're particularly bright. So, right, the zoom out is there's, there's a very obvious pair here. So a lot of people have, have sort of suspected that uh, 
that the Aussie's eyes are these two stars, right? Um, another old Norse uh, bit of star lore is that the Hyades, this V that normally sh- uh, forms the, uh, the, the face of Taurus the bull, is actually the open jaws of a great wolf. Uh, don't know any story about that. It's not Fenrir. It's, it's just, it's basically just recorded as the jaws of the wolf. Um, so that's kind of interesting, I think. Um, and then there's a, uh, in the old Norse sources, the Big Dipper is often called a uh, Karlavagen. And the Ursa Minor is called Kvenavagen, which means um, man's chariot and woman's chariot. And so um, there's a few possible associations. Odin and Frigg is a possibility, but also that Freya's chariot is uh, Kvenavagen, because uh, Freya is specifically mentioned in the myths as having a chariot pulled by a pair of cats, actually. And that Karlavagen could be uh, Thor's chariot, because Thor is specifically mentioned as having a chariot pulled by a pair of goats. So that's kind of interesting. Um and uh, Karlovagen is actually preserved to this day. There's people that call it Carl's Wayne, which is Carl's Wagon, as if it belongs to a guy named Carl. Uh, any stories about Jupiter? Yes, so any story about Zeus is a story about Jupiter, right? Uh, there are no myths that I'm aware of, no stories that I'm aware of that are just specifically about the planet, right, and its movement in the sky. But uh, we'll talk about Jupiter for the last nine minutes. Uh, so Jupiter is Zeus. That's the Roman name for Zeus. And if I can just uh, bring it up real fast. I'm sure I can find a royalty-free Jupiter picture in here. Here we go. I'll bring it up here real fast. This might be a fun sort of way to bring this thing to a close. So here's the planet Jupiter and three of the four Galilean moons. And there is some mythology behind those moons, although the ancient Greeks would never have seen them. Um, so basically Zeus's moons are all named after Zeus's lovers, right? Um, Io was trying to make sure I get him straight. So I'm going to come back to Io because I can't remember who he was in the myth. Europa was a woman that Zeus pursued and actually turned himself into a bull. And one of the associations with Taurus is that that's the bull that Zeus had turned himself into. And then to hide her from Hera, Zeus turned her into a cow. Uh, So poor Europa had to uh, sit there and be a cow uh, while Zeus hid her. And then Hera um, put a guard on the cow because she kind of suspected that this was Zeus's secret girlfriend. Uh, so she she had this giant named um, Argus, who's covered in eyes, head to toe in eyes, and never sleeps, guard her. Um, and then Hermes played his lyre and actually lulled Argus to sleep and, and killed him and rescued Europa so that she could transform back into a woman. And the eyes of Argus were immortalized by being put on the tail feathers of the peacock, which is why the peacock is um, Hera's sacred animal. So that's that's Europa, and then Ganymede is a young boy who uh, Zeus was like he's pretty, uh, and sent his eagle to go scoop up Ganymede and take him to the to Mount Olympus, and Ganymede serves as Zeus's cupbearer. He he brings Zeus his nectar. So the gods in Greek mythology they drink nectar. It's this um, special magic wine that makes them immortal, right? Uh, no, no, sorry, the, the nectar keeps them young, and the ambrosia, which is the special bread they eat, keeps them immortal. So, and then Callisto, oh man, I was just learning about Callisto, and I, I forgot, I completely blanked on Callisto's myth. That's gonna, that's gonna bug me. There's a myth about Callisto, I cannot remember it. While we're on the subject of Zeus and his, uh, his several girlfriends... Um, and turning into animals. Zeus had this weird habit of turning into animals to go pursue mortal women. So if we move over to... Oh, you know what? If we go to a different time of year... Here we go. 
Whoop, that's daytime. There we go. That should be, here we go. Yep. Cygnus. Cygnus the Swan, right? That's this constellation right here. So Cygnus the Swan is Zeus. Uh, Zeus, there was a woman named uh, Leda. Uh, just Leda, not Alita. And uh, Zeus turned himself into a swan to go be with her. It's not clear to me why he needed to be a swan to do this. But he did. And that night she also hugged her husband. And then she laid two eggs. Uh, <laughs> one of the eggs hatched and was actually Helen of Troy, believe it or not. Um, and the other egg uh, hatched a pair of twins. And this, I think, is going to be the last story. We only have like five minutes left. And those twins, I need to change the time again to bring back twins, are Gemini, right? In Greek mythology, these guys are... Whoa, whoa, what is this guy doing? These guys are called the, the, the Dioscuri or the Dioscuri. I think is how you say it. And they are uh, twin brothers and... There are different versions of the myth. The one I like the best is that um, because of the mixed parentage between Zeus and the king, because uh, he was a king, by the way, uh, Pollux was the immortal son of Zeus, and Castor was the mortal son of King Leo, Leomedon, I think is his name, Leomedon. Um, and... They got up to all kinds of shenanigans, honestly. Um, they, uh, at one point, they tried to to steal some cattle uh, from another couple of guys who were their cousins, I want to say. And it really went south on them. And uh, I think Pollux ended up getting chased up a tree. And Castor was slain in the battle. He was mortally wounded. And uh, Pollux gave up half his immortality to his brother so that he wouldn't die. And so they share the immortality of one uh, and alternate who gets to be on Olympus and who has to be in the underworld with the dead. But I also like to imagine an alternate version where they're both half mortal, so they live in the sky rather than on Mount Olympus, explaining the constellation. All right. Let's see here. We've got three minutes less left. Uh, someone's asking, Cooper's asking, how many Nevis people are going to set up telescopes? Man, I'm hoping a lot, dude. Um, again, a call to action to any Nevis people watching this. If you got a telescope, go to Fort Clinch tomorrow night. We need you. Ironically, I'm not going to set up a telescope. But that's because with the crowd being so huge... I'm going to do my sky tour every half hour so that different groups can come through and experience the sky tour. And I'm going to be kept too busy to operate a telescope. But uh, Cooper says he's going to bring his scope and binoculars. Awesome. 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 Um, well, like I said, we've got two minutes left. So I'm just going to spend those last two minutes killing a bit of time and just say thank you guys so much, as always, for watching this channel. Please remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, blah, blah, blah. All the things I have to say because I'm on YouTube. Um, but honestly, man, the fact that people tune into this thing is, it means so much to me. Because uh, I honestly, I literally am like, I'm just some dude, <laughs> right? Who just decided to start doing this and people apparently like it. And I think that's awesome. Um, you guys heard a lot of stories tonight. And the one thing I want to just say is I wanted to, I really wanted to do this episode because I do love sky, a star lore. And I do, and I love mythology, folklore, legends in general. Everyone who knows me knows this about me. Uh, in fact, this year I've carved my pumpkin. I carved the Minotaur into the pumpkin. Oh, real fast. By the way, the Minotaur has a name in Greek mythology. If you look it up uh, and the name is Asterion, which means son of the stars. Because his father was the bull of Crete, who was also represented by Taurus. So, yeah, I snuck one more in there on you guys. Um, but I just wanted to say that these, these stories, the reason I love mythology so much is I feel like it's a very human thing, right? And I feel like the stories we tell say something about us as a species. And I think it's awesome that you can learn a story from ancient Greece, from India, 
from China, from, uh, you know, indigenous peoples of, of North America, um, Australia, and yet you can relate, right? These are fundamentally human stories. And I encourage you guys to learn more stories and tell more stories. Tell me stories, man. I'm always looking to learn more. Uh, and with that, I, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. Uh, let me, uh, hold on, do the right thing here. Uh, nope, the video's over. Okay, I was going to put the campfire back up and say I want to thank you guys for joining me around the fire for, um, oh no, it's it's there, hold on. There we go. Thank you for joining me and warming your hands by the fire and listening to these stories about the sun, the moon, and the stars uh, and all the various gods thereof. And I hope you guys have a wonderful evening and keep looking up.